Exciting day of Bible stuff. Yes. Or Bible class, I guess, as we sometimes call it. Um, we are attempting to wrap up our study of the ninth commandment out of ten, uh, which, if you can do the math, means we've only got one commandment left to go. And we only have four slides left to go on this, but unfortunately, something happened this week that made detour me slightly from getting through that, but I want to talk about a little bit before we actually get started with some new stuff. And we spent the last couple of weeks, a couple of sessions of the class that I've been teaching anyway, um, looking at the, um, looking at our justice system and how it relates to the justice system in the, uh, the Old Testament and, and some of the, the, the permutations of the Old Testament system that we see reflected in our justice system. Not from the standpoint so much of us having the Ten Commandments being brought over as law, but rather some of the other aspects of the, the principles behind those laws being reflected in our laws. So now I'm going to do to you what I oftentimes do to students in my own class and ask you what you remember. Somebody said, uh-oh, yeah, I said, <laughs> what, what you remember of, that, of those principles. What are some of the principles, the underlying principles that we find in the Old Testament's law that we see reflected in our laws today. A need for proof. Okay, you need evidence. Um, and, and what kind of evidence is necessary? The primary one that's in the Old Testament is witness. Okay. Direct. So you need direct evidence from, if, there's, if death is on the line, at least how many witnesses? Two. At least two. two. Not just one, at least two. Now what else, what else does it say in terms of before you make a decision, what is what are the what is the court or the society called on to do in order to make sure it's a valid decision? Well, I don't know if this is what you're looking for, but they're called on to not pervert justice. Okay, so one of the things is they're called on to make sure that justice is done fairly, and that isn't what I was looking for, but that is absolutely the important point of that. What's the other big investigate? The, the police officer is telling us. <laughs> you know, so, absolutely. Okay. Now, and this is also one of the places where we see kind of a, a, a differential between the Old Testament's approach to justice and our approach to justice. Our approach to justice separate the investigative functions from the trial functions. So you have law enforcement is the primary investigative function. Now, there are times when the prosecutorial agency will have an element of that as well. The larger prosecutor agencies especially have investigators, typically former police officers who work and do some of the investigation. But by and large, most of the investigative work is done by the police before it's ever handed over to the district attorneys or the county attorneys or whoever else it is that's doing the prosecution. The justice system itself then, their job, its job is to try those facts, to present them to a trier of fact, whether it's a jury or a judge, and then have a decision made. The trier of fact, the jury or the judge, their job is not to go investigate facts. Their job is to take the facts that are presented to them by the police agency or the investigators. In the Old Testament, those two functions were basically overlapping. The judge was also supposed to go investigate, and the triers of fact were also supposed to know, or frequently did, know the people who were trying the case, whether it was the, the person bringing the complaint, the person who was charged with it. A jury of their peers in that case would literally be a jury of people who knew them both. Uh, today we have jury of our peers. The idea is that they are people who are similarly situated to us. Now that's an interesting question when you think about it because peers is kind of a strange term um, when we think about who our peers are. How would you describe who your peers are personally in this case? How, what, were some of, so what are some of the ways that you would describe people who are your peers? Oh. <laughs> 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 okay, so Brian speechless. <laughs> Anybody who can get me like that, that's good. But 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 in, in fairness, age is a demographic that is relevant when you come when it comes to your peers. It is hard for young people to understand where old people are coming from a lot of times, and to some extent vice versa, although at least if you are old, it presumably means at some point you were young, so you have experienced that. Uh, it may be hard to remember, but uh, <laughs> hey, she started something, so, uh, but, 
Yeah. So, so, that, so that, that, that's, a, that's a factor. What else? What are some of the other ways you would describe who you would think of as your peers? Well, I have a question about that because <laughs> how <laughs> close of a match does this peerishness need to be? Well, we're going to get to that. Because if you want to appear to me, yes, age is a factor, reasonably well educated, okay. having experienced several careers, conservative politically, responsible financially, and, and there are 12 people <laughs> in all of Mason. <laughs> no, all that you can all get all 12 of right. them to line up with okay. one of those criteria. So, so yes. those are the people I want on my jury. So that's <laughs> religious. I forgot. God, okay. God, okay. God, God. So, so you have really brought out the point that I was trying to make, and much faster than I was than I, than I thought it was going to happen. So I appreciate that because it could take could take a while otherwise. But that is that when we actually think about who our peers are, um, when we use the term the way that we use it individually outside of the, 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 the legal system, we tend to think in terms of people who are similarly situated to us socioeconomically, educationally, in terms of our religious practices, in terms of our, um, in terms of our beliefs and our behaviors in a fairly broad sense. It, it, to some extent, at least, the kind of people you would look for to be, have as your um, people that you say you regularly got together with, you know, for for some kind of event. Now that doesn't mean you wouldn't necessarily choose other people sometimes too. But for the most part, we tend to, to to get together a lot with people who look similar to us in those regards. So when we use the term peer in personal situations, we're usually talking about that. But that does become problematic. And and Ken, you said that that's the kind of person that you would want in your case. Although I would suggest to you that if you were on trial for murder, you would not want a person like that on your jury. You'd want the dumbest, most easily persuaded person you could find on your jury, who was, you know, typically was who was mistrusting of the law and whose background with with society was fairly negative. So you're playing a lawyer game. Well, yes, I am. but but that's the thing is so so what we would want if we were trying to if you were bringing a case, you'd want people like that. Right. If you were the defendant in the case, you would not want people like that. Yeah. At least not in the sense of, of one thing. If you wanted justice, you might, but if you wanted to you, you know, as a citizen, what, what defines a peer? So that's the interesting question. When you when you look at what our court system looks for for peers, it is basically US citizens. Why would that be? Why would it be that our system that our system says a peer is simply another citizen? Cultures are different. Okay, cultures can be different. Because those are the only ones that are that hold us in that particular jury system. I mean, uh, justice system. Okay, so we, we want we definitely want citizens because they're part of the system that we're judging under. So we want we want citizens. But why make it so simplified? Why not require some greater level of similarity? Sherry, you you give a different answer. What did you mean by that answer? Uh, the culture uh, in some countries approach to justice and law would be different than ours. Okay. And if you had a person like that with that kind of background in your on your jury, it might be very difficult for them to understand and to look at the evidence the same way the other eleven people might. Okay. So so if you have somebody who exam for example is a citizen of Iran um, they may apply a very different set of rules to what we would think of as criminal behavior or behavior in general, and that can be problematic. Now that raises an issue. What about somebody who has, you know, immigrated from Iran and has become a U.S. citizen, but still has a lot of those cultural things that they're carrying along with them? We'll get to that in a second. But Steve has a thought. The uh, maybe we could see the contrast if we go back to the text and say, in Israel there was a certain sense of what a peer would be and then there would be the outsiders such as the Romans or the other nations and the judgments and laws are different in those two instances okay and so if you're an Israelite being charged with something you would not want uh, Greeks to you know right be deciding accordingly and you wouldn't want Roman law to be applied to you unless it were a Roman offense that you've been charged with. And that's why they had so much trouble with Jesus, trying to figure out what was going on there. <laughs> what to do with it. Unless right, so, yeah. it would help you. Look at Paul. When the Jews 
went to get him and, and arrest him. And he said, I'm a Roman citizen. Right. So, so Paul had an unusual protection. Citizenship. <laughs> so this time Rome is better for me or that's mm -hmm. where God brought me, so I claim it. Yes. So in Rome, in Paul's case, Rome is a is a kind of an ace a trump card that he holds on to his citizenship there, which gives him the ability because what he was charged with the problem is that the Israelites, the Jewish people, had a limited ability to, to carry out their judge, judgments under the Roman rule. So ultimately they had to appeal to the Roman authority. For example, that's why to, to crucify Jesus, they couldn't just go do it themselves. And they couldn't just go stone him. They had to go through Herod and then through Pilate to actually get that done. So ultimately their authority to punish beyond a fairly limited extent ran through Rome. And because Paul was a Roman citizen, he had the ability basically to short circuit that process by saying, okay, you can't just judge me based on the way a local tetrarch or a local administrator would normally do it. I have the ability to appeal to Roman law directly. And so that created an option for him that didn't exist for most people. Okay, so um, I saw Barbara's hand a little while ago, so let me go to you first. Uh, well, I just have a question. Sure. Um, is I, I think, isn't there some place in the Bible where Jesus even says that we should take our stuff to Christians first and mm -hmm. see if they can settle a matter? Because we don't want the courts trying to settle things. Yes. In 1 Corinthians, us. Paul is talking to the Corinthians about the fact that they're going to court with lawsuits and how humiliating right. that is. But isn't yeah. Jesus said if you're going to law, go meet go the guy first. Let's right. Try, right. To, try and, to solve the problem before you. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we're supposed to try and settle things peacefully. True and not do that, so... Well, going back to today, I mean, besides citizenship, are there other criteria in the legal system that defines a peer? We're going to get to that in a second here, but I had another hand over here, I think it was Ian's. I was just going to go back to the, the peers and what does that mean and as far as like a jury situation, it wouldn't make sense to have someone sitting on a jury who's not bound by the current legal system that is presiding over said jury. Okay, so so when we talk about a jury of our peers, the, the notion of a citizen as needing to be as a necessity for being for being on the jury becomes increasingly clear. I don't think there's anybody in here who's making the argument that you know anybody should be able to because they're in the country and just go, hey, you're here to visit. We'd like you to serve on a jury. Mm -hmm. What? I don't even speak English. You know, no, it's okay, it'll be fine. You'll fit right in. No. Uh, so, so no. We don't want, we don't, we, we, there's, we definitely want people who are bound by and who at least have some vague familiarity with our system. We want those people making the judgment. Now, I don't know your name yet. Shelby. Shelby. Shelby, you had a comment. What were you going to say? In their town and their time, they would have chosen peers who were familiar with them and their situation and their faith and who had two goals honor God, restore the fellowship. Okay. In our town, in our time, our legal system pursues favorable judgment to get what I want. So we actually try to eliminate connection in order to eliminate prejudice so that every single argument and factoid that's presented can be presented in the context that's intended. And that is the biggest difference I see between today's peers and their peers is what the peers were chosen for. Okay. Are you a lawyer? <laughs> I'm not asking that to be insulting. I am a lawyer, so it doesn't bother me that you are. I'm just curious because that's the most lawyer-like answer I've had the entire time I've talked to you. <laughs> well, so. I'm just prepared to stand and give an answer. Okay. <laughs> so so Shelby has, has brought the point out, which is really important, which is that the, 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 we have there are two different systems. One of them is a system, that the, 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 the uh, Israelite system, is a system that is focused on what we would, it's a little bit of a misstatement, but, it, but it was, it's something similar to what we would call restorative justice, which is it, it, not necessarily restoring the person to society, but restoring society to what God wants it to be. Remember, over and over again, we've saw, seen, clean, you know, get the evil out of the camp, get, you know, get the bad stuff out. So it's about restoring society to societal norms and acceptable behaviors. Our system of justice is referred to as an adversarial system of justice. It is focused on prosecuting, and I don't mean that term in the, in the sense of who's in trouble, but is prosecuting the views of the two different parties to a case. So each side is trying to win, not for the good of society necessarily, but for themselves. Now, the prosecutors in a criminal case, at least theoretically, are so supposed to be doing it on behalf of society. But 
outside of criminal cases and outside of the prosecutors in criminal cases, we aren't doing it that way. And so our goal in the in general in our society is to find people who can judge the case, who will judge it fairly because it's adversarial. The problem with bringing in people who know somebody when it's adversarial is maybe they like one guy better than the other, maybe they have a predetermined opinion about the case that's not based on the evidence, maybe there's a lot of different things going on there, and when you have that kind of a situation, the adversarial system breaks down. So that's where we have two different notions of what a peer is. So again though, um, th that leaves the question then, why do we make peer so limited as just all you got to be is a citizen and we don't want you to know anybody who's involved? Why would we make it that simple? Just a citizen. I guess one point is that if you will know those people or one of them that is accused and you know that person, you might judge favorably of this person as a jury. Okay, so, so the reason... Because when you go here to you go have jury duty, to, I'm glad I don't have that no more, <laughs> but <laughs> if you have to go there and you see the people and the judge ask any, everyone, do you know right. any of them? Right. And, and so we want, we want people who don't know the people. What I'm really more interested in is why all we're saying is other than that we don't want you to know the people or have a personal uh, opinion, a strong opinion about the case going into it, that you, you know, you're not willing to listen to the evidence. Why is our only requirement that they be a citizen when we have such radically different um, education levels? And there are different races, and we've made, you know, we've looked at cases where we said, well, a case was judged this way because of racism or whatever. We have different economic levels. We have different disparities of power. Why do we only say citizenship is all that matters? I've got Ken and then I've got Steve. To a large extent, I think it's just the law of averages. The larger the pool you have to draw from, the higher the probability you're going to get a more homogenous group that will all be able to do things in a similar way. Okay, so one possibility, and perhaps I think accurately, is that if you if you have a broad pool, you can narrow that down to whatever it is, nine or twelve individuals who are able or willing to do the job and, and be capable of doing the job. Steve? Well, our justice system is based on the fact that you're presumed innocent until proven guilty. So, in my estimation, to have limits or the very things that you mentioned um, that would um, narrow the jury pool, such as age, gender, uh, social economic, whether they're wealthy, whether they're smart, educated, dumb, it doesn't matter. If you start saying they can only be this, this, or this, then you're narrowing that jury pool. And I believe that you don't have, even though it may be very frustrating, the diversity on a jury that could present different ideas in different ways in order to preserve a person's innocence if they truly are. Okay, so one of the things that our country has valued for most of its existence is the diversity of opinion and the diversity of backgrounds. And so one of the things that you can have happen on a jury by having people from different socioeconomic and educational and racial backgrounds is different perspectives on the evidence itself, which can lead to, a, at least potentially, to someone recognizing a, an issue that somebody else might not. So, so the value of having different backgrounds and different opinions is, is, is not trivial, necessarily, in a case. Shelby? Any parameter that we add to try to improve the intelligence of our jury, the, the, the preparation of our jury, would be exclusive in some way. And all of those who are who don't make the cut are now excluded from our justice system and their voice is removed. Okay, so one of the problems with, with excluding people from jury service is that jury service is a two-way street. We tend to think of it in terms of, oh man, I got a jury summons, I don't want to go do jury duty. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and most of you are retired, what are you complaining about? I mean, there are people, the, the, the apartment complex I used to live at in uh, the last time I was in, was in uh, Chandler, and there were a number of older people there, and they all showed up an hour before the mail got there and just stood around waiting for the mail to come. 
And then I guarantee every one of them would complain about having to serve on a jury, but it would have given them something to do all day at least, you know. So I mean, but anyway, we, we think about it and we complain about it because it's, it's an imposition on our time and on our, you know, attention or whatever else. But the truth is the jury service is one of the most valuable tools of citizenship that you have other than voting. <coughs> voting is, is how you determine and how you have a say in who's in charge. Jury service is how you have a say in the, the, the way that our justice system works. And if that's not as important as how of who's running the country, it's real close. So, so that when you are denied from being able to serve on the jury, when you are excluded from that, you are missing out on a powerful tool of citizenship. Now I had a whole bunch of hands come up. I think Jerry was one, somebody else over here was one, and then I've got Barbara as well. So Jerry, you go first. I have heard that the county of Neva, I don't know if it's beyond just this county, but they do exclude jurors serving on the jury over a certain age. 75. You don't, they don't automatically do it, but you can you can ask to not have to serve if you're over a certain age. So they'll send out the summons anyway, but you can send it back saying I'm over 75 and then, and then you're done. But you don't have to. If you receive the summons and you're over 75, you can still go and you can still serve and you will not be automatically excluded simply because you're over 75. It's a little different when you are living in the town where you're going to serve, too. When, uh, until just recently, we had to drive to Moe to serve. Yes. Yeah, that and, can be kind of a problem. I had to do that every day for a week. It was a pain. <laughs> when, I was, when I was down in, in Tucson, uh, and in Ajo in particular, the, although the, 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 I don't believe that the, local, the state courts sent summons to, to residents of Ohio in Tucson, but the federal court would. Uh, the federal court would do juries and grand juries, and they would be anywhere in the state they can send you, or anywhere within the district of the state. In Arizona, there's basically the sort, northern district and the southern district. There's Phoenix and there's Tucson, yeah. and you can you can end up having to go from a, go from a long way to go to federal federal jury service. And here again, that is a that can be a major imposition on your time and and on your you know your efforts and stuff like that. But there again, there's a value in doing that if you can. Well, now for some of us, you can't. But and I was going to say, and I got called to serve on a jury one time down in Phoenix. Uh, and I had to drive from here. But they at least take your hotel yeah. the night before. Yeah. So it just depends on the system. But anyway, okay, so, yeah. so so jury service is not simply an obligation, it is also a right, and that's an important thing to understand. But we're getting a little further away from what I want to kind of focus us in on, which is this, this question of, of citizens. So we understand from the standpoint of the, of the of, of citizens why being allowed to serve on a jury is a valuable thing. At least hopefully we understand it, even if we don't always feel that way when we're receiving a summons. So the, the bigger question though is, or the, the question I really want to get at, and I'm not going to keep asking, I'm going to explain this to you. The thing we need to understand is the reason why all you need to be is a citizen to serve on a jury is because we live in a country where the rules apply to everyone and where everybody has access to the same rights as everybody else. So if you, if you commit a crime, or if you're charged, I should say, if you're charged with committing a crime, you are a citizen just like everybody else, and the laws apply to you the same as they apply to everybody else for what you've done or what you haven't done. And for the same reason, the reason we let citizens, regardless of their specific backgrounds or race or gender or economics or whatever else, is because supposedly at least, it doesn't matter how much money you have or how little money you have. It doesn't matter how famous you are or how, how infamous you are in some cases. It doesn't matter any of those things. You're all, at the end of the day, we're all just citizens. It's called egalitarianism. It's not a term we use very often today because people get confused and they think we're talking about equals because we're not really educated anymore. <laughs> and, you know, it is what it is. But egalitarianism is the idea that everybody's the same. That, that whether you are, you know, the... Uh, whether you are in, uh, you know, the, the sheriff or you are the bum on the street, that, that's bad. You're the same before the law. You're the same before the law. Right. Yes, that 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 our that our country views everybody as having the same rights, and the same responsibilities, and the same basic rules. Now, now there are some obvious uh, 
exceptions or, or limitations to this, somebody who is severely mentally challenged, for example, is not going to be viewed the same way under the law as, as someone who is at least competent. Um, we're not going to expect the same kinds of things of them. But in general, for, uh, you know, for adults who are of reasonable mental health and competency, the rules are the same for everybody. The law applies the same to everybody, except one person we just found out a week ago, and that's who? The former president. president of the United States. The president of the United States, acting in their official capacity or in any way that touches on their official capacity, which is a deeply alarming fact. And I'm ap I apologize for veering into politics here, but you should all be deeply alarmed by this fact. Yeah. And, and one of the reasons you should be deeply alarmed by it is that I would challenge you to go into the Constitution or its amendments and find anywhere in there that it talks about the President of the United States having any kind of immunity. In fact, the only immunity that's mentioned in all of the Constitution with regard to public officials is the immunity, a limited immunity for congressional uh, members who are traveling to and from Congress to do their duties. That is the only immunity that exists in the Constitution. So our Supreme Court, who is supposed to be a bunch of people who believe in originalism, which is the idea that we look at what the founders wanted and what the Constitution says for what our law should say, have now told us that one person doesn't actually have to follow the law. So one person cannot be held responsible for what they do because of the job that they have. And that is our president. And that is deeply alarming. And if you think, well, it's not that big of a deal because I'm a big fan of Donald Trump and he's going to be president again, which is certainly the way things seem to be added right now, remember that right now he's not. And the man who's in the presidency right now, a lot of conservatives believe, is has either committed or is in the process of committing a bunch of crimes, and guess what? He's okay for that too. It doesn't just apply to the guy you like. This is the dangerous thing with these kinds of precedents. It also applies to whoever comes next, however bad they might be. And this is very alarming because one of the things that we see in the Bible is the idea that everybody is held to the same standard by God. And everybody, if you sin, there's consequences. David sinned and a prophet walked in front of him and said here's what you did and David immediately recognized his sin and still suffered consequences because of it. We come from a tradition, a background that says that everybody is responsible under the law and everybody can be held accountable and now it turns out that we don't, that we have somebody who's not. And that is really troubling because there's no way to fix that. There's no, as, as, as a legal commentator pointed out, there's no, the Congress can't make a law that overrules this, because they, they, this finding is based on the Constitution. The Constitution trumps everything else. The only way this law changes is the same way that the Roe v. Wade decision changes, which is to put a different court in and have that court ultimately overrule or, or overturn the previous decision. And that is a process that is probably a long way away. And the, the scarier thing is that the president is the one who appoints the court, and it's going to be hard for me to imagine very many presidents who are going to want to have their power and their 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 power diminished and their legal uh, their legal responsibility increased by going out and looking for justices who would overrule this decision. So we have a very disturbing event that has taken place. And as citizens of a country in which you are supposed to be held to the same laws as the president of the United States and a member of Congress and the sheriff and whatever else, you should be alarmed at what has happened here. I've got Ken, and then I've got Sylvia. Well, I have a question. So, I guess it was my misunderstanding that presidents do have some immunity from prosecution in certain instances already. Is that not the case? The, the only finding of immunity that existed prior to this had to do with Nixon. And what had been found with Nixon was that, and, well, there's been, actually, I take it this, there, presidents have generally been held to have either absolute or nearly absolute immunity from civil complaints against them for the acts that they did. The government more broadly has that though. So for example, um, to, to use an example I've thought about from time to time, okay? So the legislature of Arizona um, has set up rules about where you can't carry a weapon. Say for example, into a school, into a, a certain kinds of public buildings or something like that. So if I were to go into a public building and somebody came in with a gun and shot it up and I got shot, I can't sue the legislature because they took away my ability to carry a gun or I might have been able to defend myself. That is a legislative decision. They have the right to do that. They are immune from prosecutor, from, from civil lawsuit for that. And the president is the same way. So for example, the president uh, sends troops to invade um, Iran 
No, let's not do it. Iraq, let's use one that's actually happened. Since troops to invade Iraq. Afterwards, there are serious questions about the legitimacy of having sent those people and about you know what the basis for, the, for the, what we did, it, how long we left them there, different things like that. Those soldiers and their families cannot sue the president for having sent the troops over there. People who live in the country cannot bring a suit against the president for having done that. So there is an immunity from civil liability as the president. And there's a lot of really good reasons for that because of how legit litigious our society is, because of the fact that, you know, use the example I used before, a lot of different opinions could come about, about that, but if you get the right jury, I could win a lot of money in a case like that if I could bring a case like that. So, so an immunity from civil uh, liability is very different from criminal liability. So that's, there's that. Sylvia. I have, if you look at the kings of history, mm -hmm. they have more bad ones than anything else. And they were above law too. All all this could do is is get in air to war with them. Mm -hmm. To get rid of it, that was the only way. But I have another question. I mean, with the president we have, so he has immunity, I think in two ways. He's not all there. But uh, that's not immunity, that's just lack of awareness. <laughs> but his family, why? Are they not charged with the crimes they do? Like well, so. one of them has been charged and convicted of crimes. The so one that they have this immunity. No. Well, cer too? certainly immunity would not flow. What, what's going to be interesting is, and I apologize, we're getting into a, a political discussion even more than I intended to, but it's my fault. I started it, so don't. So, um, what's that? I think we need. Well, to. yeah. So, um, so. Just because you're, so one, one difference between this kind of immunity and the kind of immunity we see with kings and royalty is, typically with royalty, if you were royalty, you were pretty much above the law. At least if you were the king's immediate family or something like that. And, and the higher level you were as a noble, the less the law applied to you, depending on you know, the system. But what's gonna be really interesting to see with this is what happens when it comes to, when the president's advisors, for example, are charged with a criminal offense. When the people who work for him are charged with a criminal offense. If the president is immune from prosecution, but the people who work under him are not, then that could create a really weird situation where the president could give people orders, and if they follow them, they could be criminally prosecuted. Now, on the one hand, logic would suggest that they should not be subject to criminal prosecution if they follow the president's um, orders if indeed the president is not subject to criminal prosecution. However, our history and the way that we approach this, for example, in the military says that that may not be true. And actually it would be better if it were not true. Because the thing, the one limitation the president has is that the president, while the president has extraordinary powers, they are largely carried out through other people. The president doesn't go off and fight a war against Iraq. The president doesn't prosecute someone in court. The president doesn't arrest someone personally. People go and do that because he tells them to. So on the one hand, if there were immunity only for the president, then anyone else who engaged in illegal conduct because the president told them so to would still be vulnerable to prosecution. On the other hand, what if, 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 if the Supreme Court or other courts were to view the immunity as meaning that there's that what the president has done is not illegal, then if he gives what is a not illegal order to someone, they can follow it and do what he told them to and not be subject to prosecution because what they did would be not illegal because it came from the president. And if you thought you were worried about the, 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 the ruling from the, the first ruling, that would be terrifying. Because the thing is that one of the, one of the existing, the still existing, one of the arguments that Justice Sotomayor made in her dissent was that essentially this would give the president, particularly because the Supreme Court articulated several areas in which the president has automatic, definitely official authority, which cannot be questioned. And one of them is the commanding the military. Now, there's some very good reasons why the president should not be able to be um, prosecuted for most of the things that he does in terms of commanding the military. For the same reasons I was just saying, you don't want presidents to be second guessed for an invasion or for carrying out some kind of military activity on behalf of the country. On the other hand, as Sotomayor pointed out, what happens if the president orders SEAL Team 6 to assassinate one of his political rivals? 
and, and so he's using the military, and he's absolutely immune from prosecution for using the military. But he's using it for a reason that is purely personal and selfish. And the Supreme Court in this decision also said that you cannot judge the motives based on official acts in reaching whether there was some kind of criminal conduct. And I don't have time to explain that in full detail, but the short version of it is that if he's using the military, you cannot inquire as to why he's using the military. It is simply automatically immune from prosecution. And the question would be, if you're a member of SEAL Team 6, or you're the commanding officer of SEAL Team 6, and you get an order from the president, go kill so-and-so, can you still say, you know what, I'm not going to do that. That's, that's clearly illegal, and, and, that's, and that's something I shouldn't do. And if you say that, what are your protections against the order, the order of the president? And if you do it, are you liable for committing murder, even though the president ordered you to do it? Shelby. Well, when I enlisted, I raised my hand and I said I would defend our nation against all enemies, foreign and domestic, but I also promised to obey the orders of the officers appointed over me. It did not say anywhere in there I should pause to evaluate what they were going to say. I was supposed to trust my chain of command. I think that's going to be a problem. That's true, but also there is actually a doctrine relating to the military that says it is illegal to follow an illegal order. So if a, if a commanding officer tells you, go, you know, hose down that group of civilians with a machine gun, right. your job is to say, maybe you don't understand the situation over there, but they are unarmed civilians. Right. There's just and a so, limit at which right. I would be able to discern. There's right. My and, and so, area of understanding would be limited as a, as a young sailor or whatever. Exactly. And, and, and you don't want, whether it's a sailor or it's an airman or a marine or a soldier in the army, you don't want them, in general, stopping too, to think too hard about what they've been ordered to do. Not because we're afraid that they're going to do something bad, but because if they stop too long to think of what they're going to do, they're probably going to get killed in the process of doing it. You need people who will follow orders quickly and without a lot of reflection. But you also need people who are principled enough to recognize when an order is clearly illegal and not followed. And so there is, a, there is a very fine line there that we deal with. But in a situation like what Justice Sotomayor is articulating, you have a very problematic situation, not so much because of the question of whether it's an illegal order in the sense of going and killing somebody for no good reason other than the person of somebody else's political benefit is wrong, but in the sense of because it's an order of the president within an area which he has immunity, is it even an illegal order? That's the first question. And secondly, if you commit the, the action, are you protected by the president's immunity, or are you liable to prosecution? That is a, that's a question, and we don't know those things yet. How did the Supreme Court look at the Constitution and come up with that answer? <laughs> well, that's a question that the dissenting justices raised. And, and, and again, we are, we're dealing with six justices who claim to be originalists, which means they're supposed to look at the Constitution and the intent of the founders. And in fact, they rooted their decision entirely on a general principle of immunity and not in anything in the Constitution. You go through and read their decision, and you go through and read Sotomayor's dissent especially, she points out over and over again where they do not, and their argument, this is their argument, there's nothing in the Constitution that says that the president shouldn't be immune. But that's just so like theological argument. That is that is that is the difference between the theological arguments of the Church of Christ and the disciples of Christ when it comes to music and or internal music and stuff like that. The Church of Christ says you're not supposed to do anything that's not explicitly articulated in the Bible. The disciples of Christ say you can do anything that's not explicitly forbidden in the Bible. And and those two things are radically different. And I'm not sure I'm not saying who's right about that one. I'm just saying that those are the two different perspectives. But by the same token, originalists are supposed to look at the text and say, what does the text say that we're allowed to do and not allowed to do? That's where they, that was the legal basis on which they overturned Roe v. Wade, and I think properly so. Because Roe v. Wade was decided by the Supreme Court inventing a right out of a series of unrelated rights and pulling them all together and creating something that they called a privacy right and extending that to abortion. There's deep problems with that. But the same logic that said we can overturn a previous decision because it was wrong about that should have led to a very different result in this case. And yet what they came up with was, was a result that actually does not seem to be based in constitutional jurisprudence at all. It's based in this is, you know, this is a commonly understood thing. Although in fairness, I don't know of any other democracy that actually has this position with regard to their, um, to their prime minister or president or whatever. Um, the, the only ones that I could think of that might are Hungary and Turkey, and they are democracies, they call themselves <laughs> illiberal democracies. 
A liberal democracy is one in which uh, rights and citizen rights and human rights are respected and they are exalted above the powers of the government. Illiberal democracies are one in which the powers of the government are exalted above the rights of the citizens. So you have the right to vote, but you may not have the right to vote between very many people. You know, and you have the right to, to, you know, to weigh in on something, but we may do it anyway if you don't like it. So you have democracy, but it's kind of, it's kind of a weak democracy. And so in, in those two cases, that might be something that exists, but in, in America it never has. And so I think that there are, and there's a number of pundits who have said that this looks a lot like reinstating a kingship. And it does and it doesn't, because the one in the presence's powers have not changed. He can't do any more today than he could before. He is just less responsible for what he does. Now, what I find really interesting about this is, and this is, and this is where this should really trouble me, is that essentially what you're saying to the president is, you are immune from prosecution as long as you use official powers. You don't even, we don't even, we're not even inquire what your motive is if you're using official powers. But if you're using official powers within the motives of what you're supposed to be using them for, you're definitely immune from prosecution. So what would happen if our current president decided that our former president, for a variety of reasons that I'm not going to get into right now, were in fact a threat to our ongoing democracy, and therefore should not be allowed to have any possibility of getting back into a power, and were to do exactly the thing that Justice Sotomayor is saying could happen, which is to dispatch a, a unit of the United States military, which is absolutely under his command, and which has, for which he has immunity under this decision, to assassinate him. What if our president were to withdraw all Secret Service protection from that president? Because the Secret Service is completely under the president's control as well. It's an executive body. Uh, what if he were to do that? Would, is it, would, would we not be troubled by the fact that there's no criminal liability for that? You know, at least as far as, as this decision seems to indicate, that that should be deeply troubling to us, even if that outcome might be one that some people would find really kind of both ironic and, 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 and laudable. That kind of an outcome is not how our system is supposed to work. But we've created a situation where, or a situation has been created for us anyway, where the real possibility of someone misusing their powers without responsibility, without any sort of justice. Now, there is impeachment. Don't get me wrong. And you can remove somebody from office, and this decision doesn't affect that at all. But in terms of the ultimate liability that someone has in the courts, which are apolitical, at least to a certain extent anyway, We've already seen, historically, there's been a lot of presidents who, well, not a lot, there's been several presidents who were impeached. None of them were ever convicted in the Senate or removed from office. So impeachment is almost a purely political vehicle, and it has been since the, the early days of the Republic. So you don't end up getting presidents removed by impeachment very often. On the other hand, um, the court system are supposed to exist as a backstop to that system, so that if somebody does something illegal, there's a consequence whether they're impeached or not. Um, so my impression of what the recent decision has been, and I don't think the matter is completely settled yet, but um, is that a president or prior president is immune from prosecution for exercising any constitutional actions that he or she has available to them. So. I don't believe the references toward assassination would be included in that. Why? Because it's not within their constitutional power to do that. But if you use the military, what is the president's power with regard to the military? He can declare war. Actually, he can't. Who, who can declare well, war? Congress. Congress does, but he has to take it to He's the commander in chief, but he's, uh, yeah. I mean, we're, we can get into a pretty lengthy constitutional discussion about it, but... Would they remove citizenship from that person if the president is going to use the army because you cannot use the military on your citizens? Well, okay, so there's a, there's a law that says you can't use the military against your own citizens, right? Yeah. There's not a constitutional rule, right? So if you are the commander-in-chief and you have the authority to command the military, then a law that says you can't use it against your own citizens would be something that you could be convicted of at trial, except that because one of the one of the two or three specific things they articulated the president has to have absolute immunity for is over and, and in their command of the military. So yes, it would be illegal to use the military against a U.S. citizen, but who's going to be prosecuted for it? 
the guy who's immune for use in the military. That's a problem. So, so that, and that's that's what. Now, if he were to direct the Secret Service to do it or the CIA to do it, he might be. That might not be considered under his official acts. But the military, because the decision is is given that power without any real reservation. So, yes, show. I think we should be heavy in prayer about how this will be used in the future. Because if we are not motivated by pleasing the Lord God, our Creator, following His laws, making Him happy. Then, our, then all we have to fall back on is the societal pressures. And, and so if we remove our uh, focus on checks and balances, then not only do I have leadership that won't always be following God's precepts, but I'll also have leadership that is not concerned with social precepts that I was counting on. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I'm in prayer now, is that the people who use this now, mm -hmm. use this in the future, or are concerned with wielding this power, um, would be would be motivated by something and if, if they're not required to be faithful now they're also not required to be accountable I'm concerned about that and so I think that we should all be in prayer about that every day with how this will be wielded because absolute power corrupts absolutely yeah, something yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, and it's, it's interesting you said and I need to wrap up we're, we're over time here but I want to make one last observation there was a a video I came across on YouTube last night uh, that was done by a pastor who has talked about some of his concerns about um, the, this decision about the Trump presidency and lots of other stuff like that. And one of the points he makes is that it's really important for Christians not to go native in the sense of saying our system is God's system. Our justice is God's justice. Our rules are God's rules. Our success is God's successes in America. America has a lot of, has been impacted in a lot of positive ways by Christianity. America has some very, very good things about it. I'm going to talk about some of those in the sermon today. But America is not God's kingdom. God's kingdom is us. Wherever we are, carrying out God's will. And going native is making the mistake of thinking that because it is good for our country to be militarily strong, that it's God's will that we be military strong. Because it is good to have politicians who are decisive and who are able to make judgments that benefit the needs of our nation, that that's God's will that we have those things. And because um, it is good for us to, in on occasions, conquer someplace or take advantage of some resource, that that is what God wants from us. Those are two different things. What is good for our country may not always be what is good for God's kingdom. Those two things can exist independently. But there's a huge misunderstanding today among a lot of evangelical Christians who think that what's good for our country is inherently what God wants and what's good for God, or that we need to change our country to looking like something where both of those things are true. And God has never, ever called on Christians to do that. The Israelites were called to have a, a godly nation because they were a nation. They were an exceptional group of people who were called out as a nation to rule their own territory, to do what God wanted, and to carry out a theocratic system within that nation. To misinterpret those the passages that talk about a godly nation and God-fearing people to say, therefore, America's going to be okay if we just get everybody to follow God's rules, is to misunderstand what the new kingdom of God looks like. The kingdom of God in Israel was a theocratic, real physical government along with a spiritual existence. We are a spiritual people living among whatever kingdoms we happen to encounter. Now it is incumbent on us to do our best to try to get people who are godly and people who are moral in positions of leadership to do good things, but not necessarily because they're going to line up exactly with what God wants, and not at all because that's going to somehow make us successful as a nation. That's not how it works. So we need to be able to distinguish between those two concepts when it comes to how we apply um, the principle to how we live as Christians in a worldly nation, whether we want to admit it or not. All right, we've got to stop. I'm way over time.